Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our evening event about the role of basic research in neuroscience and in chemistry. I'm happy that you all found the way here. When we usually assess the value of basic science, it's all about products. We look at the new cancer treatment that saves life. We look at the new fabric that is light, prevents you from sweating but keeps you warm in winter at the same time. Or we look at the new algorithm that allows Amazon to suggest to you um, Schiller's tell if you've already bought Goethe's Faust. But this kind of assessing the value of basic research or the role of basic research puts <coughs> basic research in a pretty hard place. Because by definition, it's not very product oriented. So we thought that we'd like to have a closer look on how basic research works, what its role is within society and also within research itself, and how we might find better ways to assess its role and its values. We, that's the science think tank research and technology in Switzerland, short reach, we're um, mostly young researchers, students, and people interested and, and fascinated by science. And our goal is to enhance a dialogue about the role of science within our society. You can uh, check out our activities on our website or on Facebook. And you can also become a member or get our newsletter um, via the, the little sheets of paper you found on your table. Tonight, it's all about um, when we take a look back, we take a look back at discoveries in basic research in two uh, areas of research, neuroscience and chemistry. We want to look how basic research in these two areas has influenced applications. And I'm very happy that I can welcome two experts from the respective fields. First, I'd like to welcome Professor Anthony Trevis. He um, started and got his PhD at the University of London in Chemistry, but at the same time he also worked in uh, various textile and printing industries, also in London. And he's written a variety of monographs and articles about uh, chemistry and uh, technology and its links and, 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 and its history. He's currently the Deputy Director of the uh, Sydney M. Edelstein Centre for the History and Philosophy of Science, Technology and Medicine at the Hebrew Industry of Jerusalem. Welcome, Professor Travis. After Professor Travis' talk, we'll hear a talk by Professor Valerio Mante. He has studied physics at the ETH and later got a PhD in neuroscience, also from ETH. And after a postdoctoral stay at Stanford University, he came back to Zurich and is now a group leader at the Institute of Neuroinformatics of the University of Zurich and the ETH Zurich, where he studies the influence the role of the prefrontal cortex on cognition. And now I'd like to stop talking. I hope that you will enjoy this evening, that it will be an evening that is definitely not a waste, nor, uh, nor a waste uh, of time, nor of money. And before I finally stop talking, my colleague um, told me that I shall inform you that we're going to record this uh, event. So if you do not want to be recorded, just sit in the two last. Uh, Rose. Thank you very much. And now, pause for Professor Travis. Okay, thank you. And <laughs> okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and in particular the yeah, committee for inviting me to talk to you this evening. Um, I'm going to take a historical perspective that I hope will be helpful in understanding the role of basic chemistry using just two or three examples. I, if there isn't time, I'll just cover the first two topics, but you can ask me questions about the third topic later. So, that's the uh, title of my lecture, which I presume you already have. What I'm going to talk about tonight are um, two features, principally, that derive from the so-called second industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution began with textiles, iron, coal, and steam, in the second half of the 18th century. The so-called Second Industrial Revolution uh, commenced around 1860 uh, through, uh, through the role of chemistry. 
science-based industry in particular in the production of synthetic or coal tar products um, such as dyes and from the end of the 19th century pharmaceuticals and then with the emergence of electricity on a large scale around 1880 uh, chemists began using um, pro electrochemical processes both in research and in industry. Now first um, I'm going to talk about some carbon compounds. I presume most of you have a little bit of chemistry from high school. You don't need very much today, I promise you. But um, carbon compounds, in this instance, from a substance called coal tar. We go back to the 1840s. In fact, this trend dates to 1842. It's the uh, laboratory in Gießen of Justus Liebe. Um, and here you see some of his assistants working at distilling materials, examining, examining them analyzing them. These were all natural products, leaves, roots, and the such like. The most important gentleman here is on the extreme right. He is A. Wilhelm Hoffmann. Notice the top hat he's wearing in the laboratory, um, which was quite common at the time. Um, Hoffmann, in 1845, became director of the Royal College of Chemistry in London. He continued with work that Liebig had started in agricultural chemistry. Uh, agriculturalists in England hoped that having a, a college of chemistry in England, which they sponsored, would bring about improvements in crop, crop yields. It didn't work out that way. It was a sort of dead end in science. But that was, didn't matter because Hoffman was a very brilliant scientist and moved on to other areas. Okay, so um, natural products were the sort of material, were the materials that chemists were investigating. In, in the 1840s and 50s, dyes and chemicals for the massive textile industry that was the basis of the first industrial revolution, uh, fertilizers, um, Liebig for example did a lot of work on nitrogen and phosphorus compounds, pharmaceutical preparations, natural products like quinine for example, and waste. Waste was very cheap, available for the taking. This is an example of one form of waste that interested chemists. When they were lost interest in these, pharmace uh, sorry, these agricultural products, they turned to looking, look at some waste products that contained nitrogen. The main waste was coal tar. It was the leftover, the residue from distilling coal in the production of coal gas used on a large scale from the 1820s in lighting cities. Um, well, this material, coal tar, was a dark, thick oil. Nobody had any use for it. It was dumped in rivers. Then all of, uh, all of a sudden, Hoffman and some of his colleagues decided to distill this oil and see if there was anything that might be useful. Well, um, they were very lucky. They got 100, 200 compounds out of this oil, all related compounds. Although they didn't know very much about them, they began investigating them. So, um, however, to investigate them, they needed a framework of theory to discuss their experimental results. Uh, this theory, as you can imagine, organized uh, their facts, guided and provided intuition for the next experiment. Very simple, everybody does that today in science, but it was quite a new thing in the 1840s and 50s. And for example, understanding of a trend or regularity within a group of molecules led to a partial understanding that could be later refined. And that's what they did with these coal tar products. They brought them all together, and they developed very simple theories so that at least they could discuss what they were working with. Now, this is called the ball and stick model. Um, each one of these balls has a label. On the left, we see H. It has a little stick. It's called its combining uh, power or valency. Um, you have to satisfy the valency. And one way of doing it is combining with oxygen, which has a valency of 2. But now uh, oxygen has it, one of its va valencies unsatisfied, so it joins with another uh, hydrogen, and all the valences are satisfied. That's H, O, H, or what we call H2O. And this was quite a very uh, significant pedagogical tool around 1850. Very simple by our, our standards. Then you can move on to another group of compounds, those based on carbon. This uh, product at the left is marsh gas. It's the methane obtained from distillation of coal that is used in, even to this day in lighting. Now, carbon has a valency of four, so it needs four uh, other elements with a, a valency of one to satisfy its valencies, and so therefore CH4. But we can replace those H's one by one going from left to right, and we arrive with a group of chlorinated hydrocarbons. 
This was all two-dimensional work, ball and stick models, uh, but sufficient for the needs of a lot of chemistry, but not for these uh, compounds that came from coal tar. They are what we call aromatic. In these compounds, carbon has a valency of six, and, bi and um, uh, sorry, carbon has a valency of four, but there are six atoms, hydrogen a valency of one, there are six atoms, and nobody could sort out any ball, could, could create a ball and stick model. Uh, this remained a mystery, but it nonetheless stimulated laboratory research into benzene and related products. Benzene was the simplest hydrocarbon obtained from distilling uh, this coal tar material, but the majority of the compounds were somehow related to benzene or similar compounds. Okay, um, then by the 1850s there was an interest in synthesis. Um, not just understanding uh, what the compounds were, but maybe making new synthetic compounds, particularly from coal tar. And um, Hoff Hoffman's research in London led him to suggest that maybe the natural antimalarial quinine could be synthesized on the laboratory bench. Now, that's a very difficult thing to do even today, but in the 1850s that was remarkable. In fact, very naive. And in fact, just as well it was very naive, because in 1856, one of his assistants actually attempted this in the Easter vacation, but his reaction failed. There are lots of failures in science, but you just have to keep going on. This is his student, his name is William Henry Perkin. He was 18 years old when he did this. But what was remarkable, although the reaction failed, he just got a, a murky oil, he could have just thrown it away and said, I'm going off to play football and, you know, that's the end of it. No, he was a good scientist. He wanted to find out why did his reaction not work. He started with a compound to some extent related to benzene, but far more complex. And he decided to go back to the simplest of these aromatic compounds, benzene itself, and make a derivative and see what would happen. This time, he, the reaction still failed. He couldn't find, uh, couldn't understand what he was doing. But he took some alcohol, mixed it with his murky oil, and got a beautiful purple solution. And he was not stupid. Purple was the colour of fashion in the mid-1850s. It was a colour worn by Queen Victoria and the Empress of France and the ladies of London and Paris and Berlin. And Perkin realised that if he looked at this material, if he perhaps, perhaps by accident, he just spilled some on a piece of cloth. But he realised it was a nice purple. Purple was the colour of fashion. And he also knew that natural purple dyes faded uh, very quickly, especially in the polluted uh, cities, uh, atmospheres of cities. So he tested his uh, purple, and he found actually it resisted the, uh, the effect of pollution. It resisted the effect of light. It resisted the effect of soap. So here was a very a potentially useful guy. Now the yield was about three or four percent, but he realised that this was a valuable dye because it was a colour of fashion and because of its particular properties. Here you see our prints, two prints made with this mauve dye about 1860, and this is a perfect example of what we might call accidental science or serendipity in science. Something going wrong, but if you keep working at it, perhaps sooner or later you'll find something that's gone right. And as a result of this, he set up a little factory with his father and a brother in northwest London. And this was the very first of the so-called synthetic dye factories. In fact, it was the first factory to make synthetic organic chemicals on a substantial scale. These were coal tar products. And in the meantime, other chemists began doing the same as Birkin had done. He made a lot of money out of this. Even Hoffman started looking at these reactions. And within five or six years, there were purples, blacks, greys, blues, and greens. Now, the problem was, how do we represent them? With those models I show you, absolutely impossible, because they're mainly derivatives of benzene or benzene-like compounds. Then in the mid-1850, partly a result of this interest amongst uh, industrialists and chemists working on the benches as Hoffman, uh, a German chemist called Kekede came up with this structure, a hexagon. You've probably seen hexagons on the advertisements of pharmaceutical and chemical companies. It's a symbol of chemical industry, also on boxes of pharma pharmaceutical products. And what happened here is Kekele said, if carbon can't satisfy its valences um, like the other so-called aliphatic chem uh, chemicals, maybe it can satisfy them by double bonds if we draw a 
hexagon, we have alternating double bonds. And that's why he drew two structures, because it could be one or the other. And this is how we look at benzene today. Now, with this model, chemists could go much further in the design of synthetic pathways. This was quite something. And the molecule that uh, Perkins started with was actually called aniline. And you can see now that Kekulé had come up with this structure, almost 10 years after Perkin did his research, it was possible to draw the structure of this molecule, aniline, because it's the same as the structures I just showed you, except one hydrogen is replaced by the so-called amino group. And it's called aniline, and hence the name aniline dye industry. And if you read economic history, you will see reference to the synthetic dye industry, which is also called the aniline dye industry. Okay. Now, fundamental structures, uh, sorry, work on uh, fundamental stu uh, studies on structures. This became very important. It aided the design of synthetic pathways in carbon, or in this case, aromatic chem chemistry. This is one branch of carbon chemistry, the other I've referred to in passing aliphatic. So, experiments were designed to discriminate between rival hypotheses. A lot of people didn't believe Kekulé. They just carried on. They didn't even believe there were atoms and molecules you could draw. So, but there, so there's a lot of work, synthetic work and theoretical work. <clears throat> um, and what I want to talk about mainly today is the fact that with all this information, the discovery of useful products stimulated basic research, which in turn led to new useful products, not just the dyes that I mentioned, about which nobody knew anything regarding the structure, but other products I'll tell you about in a moment. But in particular, Scientific and technological basic research together achieve results difficult to obtain by either kind of research. And the person who, to my mind, uh, personifies this best is the German chemist Heinrich Cairo. Heinrich Cairo, in the 1850s, was an apprentice in a textile printing works in Germany. He also learned part-time chemistry at Berlin University. He didn't qualify, that was not important. And um, this is the sort of work that he had to do as an apprentice in the 1850s. Very difficult work, seven days a week. He studied night and day. These are his original pattern books. He learned how to extract dyes from natural products, how to apply them, how to fix them to the fabric, and how to use the machines. And his, book, his notebooks today are preserved at the Deutsches Museum in Munich, and they show all the amazing drawings that he did. Quite a remarkable uh, person. Now, one compound he looked at, as had many of the compound other uh, chemists, was um, the red dye obtained from the root of the madder plant. It was the basis of the famous turkey red dye, which is still used today in carpet dyeing. The root of the plant gave a red compound. It was analyzed and given the chemical name alizarin. The analysis often were not quite right, but it didn't matter. At least people were trying to find out what, what this material was. And around the time that um, Cairo was doing this work, a number of methods had been developed, chemical methods, for improving the quality of the natural product, extraction, distillation, and so on. And uh, he became a, a fantastic expert. At the end of the 1850s, he went to England. In 1859, in fact, just as Perkins dye was becoming popular. He learned all about the synthetic dye industry, all about these aromatic compounds, and in 1866 uh, returned to Germany. And he jo joined the newly formed Badischer Aniline und so Soda Fabric, we call it BASF, which celebrates its 150th anniversary this year. So he joined this company, as you can see, the company produced dyes that received many medals. But I want to draw your attention to the huge factory in the Oval. When this factory started out, it was like Perkins' factory. This drawing dates from about 1890. What is remarkable, practically all these buildings are related to discoveries made by Heinrich Cairo or result from his collaborations with chemists in industry and the academic world. It was a massive boom starting with Perkins' simple product that he didn't really even understand. Even to this day, we're not uh, certain of the structure of Kirk, uh, Perkins' product, although a lot of it, uh, work has been done by historians in the last, uh, last decade or so. Now, here's an example of the sort of thing that Heinrich Cairo got involved in. We see standing up left, oh, sorry, I'm sorry that the, not everything's here, but that's Adolf Bayer. This is in Berlin. 
in around 1867. Um, his two assistants seated are Carl Lieberman at left, Carl Graeber at right. Now these two young men, these assistants, decided they would look into the structure of alizarin. Nobody knew anything about it. There were lots of controversies. It was believed that perhaps the mother substance was a hydrocarbon based on naphthalene. It was one of the materials that occurred in coal tar. Well, over one weekend, they found that after 20 years, the people who'd been working for 20 years had got it wrong. The mother substance was anthracene, which is like three benzene molecules in a row fused together. And within a few days, they actually made, on the laboratory bench, synthetic alizarin. This was quite remarkable, because it was probably the first uh, molecule of any complexity that replicated something in nature. Forget you know, the you know, work on urine and things, urea and, and things like this that had been done some years before. But this was really remarkable. Now, here, is, uh, here are some examples of two fabrics that have been dyed with the synthetic alizarin. Far better quality than the natural product. But in the white box, there are three formulae. One is aniline, which I mentioned earlier. On the left is alizarin. Now, if you think about these people in the 1860s working with test tubes and simple pieces of apparatus, that is amazing that they could come up with this structure. And that is exactly what Heinrich Cairo and Adolf Bayer, who was one of the most famous organic chemists in the 19th century, did. In 1874, through this academic industrial collaboration, they published in an academic journal this chemical structure. Absolutely remarkable. In 1883, in a private letter from Bayer to Cairo, they were then working on the structure and possible synthesis of indigo, the natural dye. Bayer wrote the structure at bottom right. Again, simple apparatus, test tubes, colors. These, what, these are the correct modern structures of these two natural compounds. Alizarin and indigo were the most important natural dyes. Okay, now probably you've never heard about any of the people I mentioned. It's not important, but you probably know this gentleman, Friedrich Engels, the colleague of Karl Marx. And look what he says. This reflects the tremendous impact on society and even on uh, political thinking. The chemical substances produced in the bodies of plants remained such things in themselves until organic chemistry began to produce them one after another, whereupon the thing in itself became a thing for us, as for instance, alizarin. He's referring to the synthesis in the laboratory. <clears throat> the coloring matter of matter, which we no longer trouble to grow in the matter roots in the field, but produced much more simply and cheaply from coal tar. Tremendous impact. This is high-tech industry in the 19th century. Nothing like it before. Uh, this is some of the chemicals produced, or some of the dyes produced, by the Badisha aniline, and you can see some, just a few of them. They, they produced thousands. They had screening campaigns, made one compound one after another, and they were helped by this benzene ring and the ability to take groups, uh, add them, take them out, Chunk, modify them, and get a whole range of compounds. They dealt with thousands of, of compounds. Not all of them were commercially viable. That didn't matter. Just a few of them would bring enormous profits to the company and would encourage further research. In fact, it was the profits that were wisely invested that enabled new products to be developed. And all of this arose from academic industrial collaboration. Okay. Uh, you have to organize all this information. Not, you don't just need theories, you need a laboratory, a central research laboratory. And this is a central laboratory that to this day stands at the works of BASF in Ludwigshafen. It was designed by Heinrich Cairo in the late 1880s, just before he left Badisha Aniline. Here, um, new research was done, basic research, fundamental research, collaborations with academia, and very important, in litigation over monopolies, it was absolutely essential by the late 1880s to understand and draw the structures of chemicals. And these, there was a section here, a special laboratory designated for support of patent litigation. A lot of scientific research developed through these unusual, um, shall we say, the, the, these unusual methods. These were not scientists 
who were trying to find new things for the sake of it. They were trying to protect the company's uh, monopoly. Okay, and the big success at the end of the 19th century was the synthesis in industry of indigo carried out by the Hearst Dye Works and BASF. And this wiped out the Indian trade, which was monopolized by Britain. Germany was becoming self-sufficient in all its textile needs. The same had happened with alizarin, which came from France and um, Greece and other countries. Germany not only had become self-sufficient in these products, more importantly, it became a major manufacturing nation. You probably heard of Krupp and other companies in terms of the 19th century, or AEG. But the dye industry was the model for all the other industries in Germany um, that succeeded so well. Now, I want to change the uh, subject a little bit. Out of all this work, there were new theories about how chemical company, uh, chemicals form colored solutions, colored products, for example. A uh, theory was uh, developed in 1875 on dyes and color, color and constitution. This actually enabled chemists in the laboratory to predict the colors they were going to produce, and often they were correct, by manipulations of molecules, by prior knowledge, bringing them all together, as in, for example, the laboratory I just showed you. But there was one man who took this theory and developed it in biomedical science. His name was Paul Ehrlich. Here we see him around the year uh, 1900, surrounded by his papers, his publications, his articles, but in particular, look at all the little bottles on the shelves. They're all dye stuffs. He got his doctorate by studying dyes, how they stain uh, organisms. He came up then with a theory of oxidation reduction processes in living organisms. Quite remarkable. And then he took this theory of color and constitution and <coughs> developed it into the so-called side chain theory, which uh, was a tremendous help in understanding immu immunotherapy, and for which he received the Nobel Prize for Medicine or Physiology in 1908. This, again, a remarkable piece of work. Now, it's a very simple model, but it's based on a theory of color and constitution um, that had been used in predicting the nature of dyes, and from this, all the modern theories that are used in biomedical science have developed. And here uh, we see um, Ewek with his uh, Japanese colleague, Sahashiro Hata, who together develop a substance that attacks sites of infection within the body. This was 1909, again, based on analogies with dye chemistry. The, com the chemical was manufactured by the Hearst Dye Works, and um, it was the only one of its kind and these dye companies, at least some of them, especially the bio dye works, spend a lot of time and effort trying to create new products, often analogs of dyes, to see if they would attack sites of infection within the body. And in the mid-1930s, following a screening campaign, because that's all they could do at the time, just take hundreds, maybe thousands of chemicals, and try them one at a time, and see what if something came up. Uh, this compound, Trontosil, the first um, compound active against streptococcal infections was discovered, incidentally based on a chemical that Cairo had made in the 1860s in Manchester. Of course, in his days, people were not doing this work. So often it's a matter of going back to the past and finding out um, if some chemicals that were made maybe 50 or 100 years ago can be used today. And this is quite often the case. DDT is a perfect example. DDC was developed in Basel in 1939 by the Seba company, by the Geiger company, sorry, but DDD had been around perhaps 100 years, or at least the chemical constitute, the chemical compound. Okay, now I ended this session with uh, the cover of a book. Um, this is the cover of a book about Robert Burns Woodward, who was the 20th century star of synthetic organic chemistry, and quite rightly, described here as architect and artist in the world of molecules. But note what he's handling, apart from his cigarette. These are ball and stick models, just like those I showed you at the beginning. The only difference is they're in three dimensions, because a lot of other work had been done uh, regarding the understanding of chemicals. Now, uh, I'm going to move on now for a brief history, this time, of nitrogen. The nitrogen, nitrogen for those who have forgotten, represents almost 80% of the gas around us in this room. It's a very inert, stable material, but it's essential for uh, plant growth. 
And the story of its capture is a remarkable story. Um, it began actually in the early 19th century when Alexander Humboldt was uh, on a voyage, literally a voyage of discovery. He was going around South America, uh, gathering all sorts of funny materials. And he was particularly interested in those three little islands just offshore. Because the material on those islands, the natives had told the Spanish, helped crops grow. What was it? Bird droppings. Dropped at the rate literally of 10,000 tons a year over hundreds of thousands of years. And you'd have thought, well, here's another example of a waste product that perhaps could be put to use. Well, our friend um, Liebig was not very keen on this stuff. He said, look, there's enough waste material in China, Europe, and everywhere else, and if you use it efficiently, human waste, animal waste, that's fine. But he soon changed his mind when it was found that this uh, material, which is guano, contained phosphorus as well. So we have two important chemicals that are critical for plant growth. And within a short time from around after 1840, this was a tremendous industry. Now look at this picture. 60 ships waiting to be loaded up with guano. This bird, animal, this bird waste, all to be taken to North America, Hamburg, Liverpool, and London. Some people became very wealthy out of this industry, and uh, the economy of Peru boomed tremendously. Well, about 1870, that all, that, the best stuff had been used up, at least the best the material that was best used in fertilizer. Um, but luckily for the Europeans and the South Americans, there was another source in the Atacama Desert, something like 300 kilometers inland um, from the coast of Chile. Um, this is a material called saltpeter or sodium nitrate. It was used initially in making gunpowder and nitric acid. But as the other material I mentioned, the guano, ran out, it was increasingly adopted as a fertilizer. Um, this was um, a massive industry in its own right. By 1890, a million tons, uh, sorry, a hundred million tons were exported to Europe uh, as fertilizer. And you can imagine this was a time of massive growth of populations, especially in Europe and North America. So this was really critical. But uh, there were places where there was concern over the control of markets. After all, uh, it was on in, uh, <clears throat> this material was in Chile. There were lots of investors, but mainly from London that control, helped control this industry. Um, the reason there were control, uh, problems over, over control of markets because of new explosives were developed like picric acid and TNT. Now what are these explosives? They're not a great deal unlike the sort of chemicals that William Perkin and the dye companies made. They're called nitro compounds, like aniline, they're intermediates. In, other words, in order to make aniline, you have to make nitrobenzene. So, if you're going to make these nitro compounds, you need lots of nitrates to convert into nitric acid. And that's absolutely critical, and especially in Germany around 1900, with the expansion of agriculture and the military. Germany had been doing very well, learning how to be self-sufficient in dyes and organic chemicals. But now the German industry had made so much money that it diversified. Agfa went into photo products, this is another dye firm, Hearst Pharmaceuticals, Biolator Pharmaceuticals, but BASF decided that its, diverse, its uh, diversif diversification program would be based on nitrogen products. They'd invested vast amounts of money in the uh, indigo synthesis, uh, it was a very risky venture and it paid off, and they were not going to let this one go. Okay, well, at around the same time, chemists in Germany and England had been warning that, you know, forget the who controls the market, one day maybe the nitrate, the Chilean nitrate, will run out as well. What are we going to do? We'd better start looking at making a synthetic nitrogen compound. And uh, Crookes himself suggested that the basic research might be based on fixing this gas nitrogen around us as a stable compound using an electrical lock, something like a lightning spark. When lightning flashes, it captures nitrogen. So if that could be made to happen, and they knew it could happen, they've done it in the laboratory on a small scale almost 100 years before, it forms nitri uh, nitric oxide, that is between nitrogen and oxygen joining together, and then nitric acid easily formed. But to do this, you need vast amounts of energy, electrical energy ideally. And where you're going to get cheap energy uh, from electricity, the best place is hydroelectric power. This is the Niagara Falls on the border between 
Canada and the United States. One of the first compounds made using um, hydroelectricity was calcium carbide. It was made from coal and limestone, but calcium carbide was used in so-called acetylene or carbide lamps. Some people still use them today. They cal Remember calcium carbide, I'll come back to it in a moment. Okay, here's the sort of electrical power stations that were developed around 1900. This one, the Ontario Power Company's power station, opened, I think, in 1902 and supplied energy to the chemical industry um, close by. Well, how do you fix this nitrogen through an electric spark? Very difficult. Two gentlemen had started making this uh, nitric oxide using energy from the Niagara Falls in 1902, but closed down in 1904. But there were many technical problems, as well as financial problems, um, and it was left to this uh, gentleman, Professor Christian Birkeland, a Norwegian physicist. He uh, was a keen inventor and explorer. He worked on, for example, on the magnetic field of the Earth and came up with a theory of the aurora borealis, which was rejected but proved correct in the 1960s. However, he didn't have enough money to fund his research, so he began inventing things, including an electromagnetic gun. On the first demonstration in 1903, it blew up. But he was clever. He noticed that the flame coming out of the barrel was deflected by the electromagnetic field. So you might say, so what? Okay, a few weeks after that, he met a, a gentleman called Samuel Ide, who was entre an entrepreneur in Scandinavia in the field of hydroelectric power generation. He suggested to Birkenland, why not try make a massive flash like a flash of lightning and form this nitric oxide which we can then convert to nitric acid. It took two weeks for Birkenland to come up with this uh, pilot plant and you, you see Mr. Ide is on the left, uh, Professor Birkenland on the right. And within five years, this is what they were doing. These were not really flashes of lightning. These were like miniature suns, each one ge generating nitric oxide, very low yield, but it didn't matter. The energy cost practically nothing, and the raw materials, nitrogen and oxygen, absolutely nothing because they come out of the air. Okay, so this is a vast industry. Now, I mentioned earlier calcium carbide. These two gentlemen in 1895 tried to use uh, substances like calcium carbide to make cyanides for use in the um, extraction of rare metals. But their process didn't work until one of them observed that this calcium carbide itself reacted with nitrogen. But you had to heat it up to about 1,600 degrees. And if you're going to make that sort of product, you need a lot of energy, electrical energy. You need a huge oven. And so it's ideally near a site of a hydroelectric power station. Well, this became an excellent fertilizer. It was introduced in Italy, Norway, Japan, Germany, and the USA. I should point out the reason that Italy and Norway were interested is because both countries had plenty of hydroelectric power. They had limited areas given over to tillage. 70% of um, Japan is covered in forests, and the Japanese don't like cutting down their forests. So they both adopted this process. In the meantime, neither country was very well endowed with uh, coal compounds, so they lost out on these earlier industries based on coal products. Now they were the world leaders in production of nitrogen compounds. And uh, this is an example, sorry, can I ask how much time I have? About 10 minutes left. 10 minutes, okay, I should get through this one. Sorry, everybody. Okay, this is an example of how the industry grew. Uh, on the left is Odder, near Bergen. This is where cyanamid, calcium cyanamid was manufactured, is export, exported all over the world. The other two sites, Natoda and Yukan, these, were, these are sites where the Birken and the ice, ice process will work. And these two sites became the basis of Norsk Hydro, a very big multinational corporation. In fact, it was Norway's first uh, multinational corporation. Now, all the materials they were making was exported. It was, rec sorry, oh. it was exported, uh, used on a very large scale. Now, all you need to look at is the kind of part, parts of this picture. The furnaces were making carbide and cyanamide, required vast amounts of energy. Well, the, an earlier slide showed that somebody called Polzenius came up with a catalyst that reduced the energy requirement of cyanamide furnaces, but still, a lot of energy was required. This is the basis of the manufacture of calcium cyanide. 
Now, there was another approach to capturing nitrogen, making the chemical called ammonia. It's a horrible, smelly stuff. You may have had it at home. You're probably familiar with the smell. Uh, it's a very simple formula, NH3, and um, that was considered another potential um, nitrogen compound that could be used and made into something solid that could be applied to the ground. The work on this was started by a number of scientists, um, in particular Wilhelm Oswald, a German physical chemist. This was a whole new branch of chemistry, physical chemistry, based on kinetics and thermodynamics that had developed in a, uh, since the 1860s. Well, he managed to convert uh, nitrogen and hydrogen to ammonia by heating them at a high temperature in the presence of a catalyst, something that speeds up the reaction. And we believe also in the presence of pressure. Now, BASF, as I mentioned earlier, were very keen on uh, developing nitri uh, nitrogen's uh, fixing processes, and they went to look at his process, but unfortunately for Oswald, who had made ammonia, the nitrogen didn't come from the air, but from the metal of the apparatus, so he lost out. Well, um, now we have to, these are the, to get insight from fundamentals, these are the two areas that people like Oswald had used in their studies. The great branch of physical chemistry had grown uh, by just after 1900, thermodynamics and kinetics, I won't bore you with the fine detail, we don't have time, but this gentleman, Fritz Haber, who you probably have heard of. Can anybody tell me in which? What do you know about Fritz Haber? Sorry, I have to ask the audience a question. Yes? The Albert Blush process. Very good. Well, I didn't expect that result. I thought somebody would th say he was the pioneer of large-scale gas warfare. He said at the same time. But very good. I'm glad you said that because very few people have picked that up. Great. So, okay. Uh, Fritz Haber, he studied he started off as an organic chemistry, moved on to applying electricity in organic chemistry, and then on to physical chemistry, including gas reactions and application of electricity. Here we see him in 1906, he'd just become a professor at Karlsruhe in Germany. Uh, there was a lot of rivalry between these physical chemists. Walter Nernst, uh, who just developed the third law of thermodynamics in 1906, in public told Haber, You've got all your results wrong, you're, not, you're just messing about, don't waste your time. In any case, you've forgotten to apply pressure. After all, these are gases, you have to push them together. Well, Harbour was very angry. He went back to his laboratory and set up a high-pressure uh, research group. This is Karlsruhe, with all his colleagues, some from Japanese, second from um, left seated is a young English postdoc, Robert Nerosinol. Seated on the ground is a very skillful technician. Kirsch, uh, Mr. Kirschenbaum, and behind him is Fritz Haber himself. Well, Haber started all this work, and he got one of his Japanese uh, colleagues to investigate the specific heats of reactions. This man worked crazy, day and night for weeks and weeks, and he enabled a reaction to take place. His name was uh, uh, Professor Tomaru. He became a very important chemist in Japan after the First World War. Um, uh, using his information about specific heats and the like, and other uh, aspects of this reaction, Fritz Haber and Le Rossignol and, his tech and their technician came up with this. Well, you, it looks like a subway map. What is important? First, the yield is only 2 or 3%. While Nernst was wrong and Haber was correct with the calculation, Nernst was correct regarding pressure. This is a closed apparatus using a pressure of 200 atmospheres 3 to 5% of ammonia is formed um, using a, a catalyst, a rare metal called osmium. And I won't go into fine detail, the converter, what is called the converter is at left, this is where the gases, very hot gases under high pressure in the presence of a catalyst are forced to react together, the ammonia is isolated and the unreacted gases were sent back to be reacted again. This was the basis of an industrial process, Harbour thought. Nobody else thought of doing this. Um, BASF suddenly got interested. They were not interested in this until 1909. They were looking at uh, the electric arc type of process. Well, uh, this gentleman, his, Mr. Bosch, who came down to uh, Karlsruhe on the 1st of July 1909, looked at the apparatus, said, switch it on, and it blew up. <laughs> so he went back to Karlsruhe, but he did leave two colleagues, who the next day saw the apparatus repaired, and it worked beautifully. They reported to the board of BASF, who decided to invest in the process. But to get this to work uh, meant overcoming many, many technical problems. One of them is finding a cheap catalyst. You could not use osmium in those days. 
practically all the osmium that they had um, was just about 100 grams, I think, the whole world supplied. If they'd have put it in this sort of apparatus, it would all disappeared in a few moments. So after almost uh, 7,000 tests, screening program again, with different um, formulations of potential really good catalysts, they come up with an iron catalyst containing what are called promoters. On the left is a full-size mock-up of the harbor apparatus. Um, it's not the real thing because his apparatus blew up as well. These are, this is very dangerous work, 200 atmospheres. Carl Bosch had to overcome another problem. The problem of the hydrogen in the gas mixture under these brute force conditions reacting with carbon in the steel and causing the steel to become brittle so that the pilot plants kept blowing up. In those days, they didn't have the sort of steels we have now. Uh, and he came up with a double wall converter to it, allowing the gas under high pressure, the hydrogen in particular, to pass through. There was not much carbon, very little, if any, reaction. And then it gathered in the grooves, cooled down, pressure was reduced, and then some of it could be released to the atmosphere. This was the way that Bosch overcome the problem of the explosions of the reaction in the reaction. Here we see um, one of the converters being made, full size. Now, it's a bit like a cannon barrel. Needs, you know, again, brute force conditions. Who better to make this than the Krupp Steelworks, which was making all the guns and armaments for Germany. So in September 1913, PASF, at a site near uh, Ludwigshafen, set this reaction up. The reaction was put, was, uh, got going. Harbour became very famous. He became first director of the very first Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. Um, and here we see him with one of his colleagues there for a few years, Albert Einstein. Well, okay, what happens next? War. Just one year later, war breaks out in Europe. Everybody thought it would be over by Christmas and they'd go home. But there was a problem. The stalemate and a prolonged war as a result of the Allies stopping the Germans from getting to Paris. This meant they needed more munitions, vast amounts of munitions to conduct a war. The Western Front alone was 500 miles of trenches that stretched from the English Channel all the way to Switzerland. And to make this material, they needed nitrogen products. And where did the Germans get it from? Like everybody else, Chile. Until the 8th of December 1914, when the German Southeast Asian squadron was sent to the bottom of the ocean. From that moment on, Germany was denied access to nitrates. But the Germans were very clever. They'd come up with all these processes, in particular the ammonia process. This is a factory at Leuna or Merseburg to the, in the middle of Germany because uh, Ludwigshafen is quite close to France and was bombed several times. This is out of the bombing range of Allied aircraft. This vast factory did nothing else but make ammonia from 1917 onwards. Without these processes, not just this process, Germany would have had to finish the war two years earlier. Here we see the first train about to leave in April 1917 carrying tanks of ammonia that's converted into nitric acid used to nit nitrate aromatic compounds for explosives. And this will give you an idea of the, ex the extent to which Germany constructed these factories for war purposes. And of course the chemical companies loved it because they were all state sponsored. They knew when the war was, open, was over they'd have a vast market in artificial fertilizers. They, uh, the Allies couldn't equal this. They couldn't do anything equal to the Harbour Bosch process. So they kept to the cyanamide process. Look at this vast works in the United States. Just to make this cyanamide, it, this factory was finished in 1918 in the month of November. That was the month the war finished. This factory never made one pound of cyanamide. Hundreds and hundreds of these ovens from, ready for making it and it was just destroyed later on. Um, okay. This is to emphasize again, the inability of the Allies to make this material led to a lot of basic research during the war in universities, state and industrial labs. For example, in the UK, in the United States, France, uh, Italy, and also in Japan. And the modern peacetime fertilizer industry actually uh, owes its existence to this gentleman, uh, uh, an Italian by the name of Luigi Casali. Because unlike the other companies, when they did finally make this uh, ammonia by a synthetic route, Casali decided to license his process to anybody who wanted it all over the world. He was a loner. 
He wasn't tied up with a multinational national company. So Luigi Casali worked not only with a process similar to Harper's, but with a pressure of 800 atmospheres. They had enough problem, but 200 atmospheres, 800 was enormous. But this meant the gases were more compressed, you needed less factory space. Also that the ammonia could be obtained as a liquid, which was good in refrigeration, was a much better uh, process. So in 1921, he inaugurated what effectively was a global interest industry as a result of his licensing the process. The others caught on later on. The BASF, BASF, I should point out, did not license its process because it wanted, unless people were prepared not only to pay a lot of money, but also give BASF some control of the company or the output. So Casale was very important in inaugurating this industry. And then there was a man called Fowles from another uh, in Italy, a uh, cloud in France, and various other competitors. And only in the 1930s was BASF prepared to allow others to use its process because there was a big recession, there was overproduction of nitrogen products, and um, then the, the uh, other companies joined in. Incidentally, this is uh, a Casali apparatus, very similar to the Harbour apparatus, but very, very different conditions. This is the first factory to, to use this process at Nobioka in Japan in 1923. And where do you get the hydrogen from to make the ammonia? Well, nitrogen's in the air. Okay, I'm nearly there, but one minute. Okay, thank you. Um, hydrogen is, uh, the need for hydrogen created a whole new industry in its own right. There were various processes called coke oven processes, uh, water gas processes, but one interesting uh, process was just electrolysis. You probably did this at high school. You stuck two electrodes in, you got hydrogen and oxygen. And this, especially in the Casali process, was used on a vast scale, again, because of the availability of a tremendous amount of electrical industry. Well, I just add, I point out that Harbour had become famous, so famous, in fact, that he received retroactively the 1918 Nobel Prize for his work. Um, and Carl Bosch also received the a Nobel Prize in 1931 with um, a man called Bergius, who at least Together, they've been working on high pressure chemistry. And it's very, you know, this is very significant because the first time an industrial process led to a Nobel Prize. And today, uh, half the world's population is, f is fed by the basic Harbour Bosch model. And I want to end with two things. And then I promise I finish. <laughs> okay. um, there's a, a very good writer on energy called Vaclav Smith, Smil. He says that the Harbour Bosch process has been of greater fundamental importance to the modern world than the airplane, nuclear energy, space flight, or television. And finally, you've all heard of Bill Gates, if you've never heard of anybody else I mentioned. He says, these days, this is two years ago, I get to spend a lot of time trying to advance innovation that improves people like, people's lives in the same way that nitrogen fertilizer did in the beginning of the 20th century. Okay, everybody, thank you very much. with us for the opera, right, afterwards? Oh, absolutely. Okay, great. <laughs> because then I'll almost have to postpone the questions to the apero, then we can have it uh, discuss this further with a glass of wine and some sandwiches. Okay. And uh, I'd directly like to give the word to uh, Valeria Monte after having thanked you again for this very entertaining history, uh, tour through the history of chemistry. And uh, I believe there will be some questions after the I hope so. Thank, Thank you. you very much again. Thank you. Um, so, um, I'll be talking about neuroscience then, basic research in neuroscience, or uh, why bother understanding it? Right? Okay, so why would you want to understand the brain? Now, of course, understanding the brain is also about understanding ourselves. Okay, so, um, humans, since humans have existed, have asked uh, where our thoughts come from, what is consciousness, what is perception. Um, and neuroscience is really just the latest incarnation of, uh, of this quest, and, and hopefully the last one, the one that would actually give us the answer. Um, and answering these kind of questions, I think, for some people is enough justification to perform basic research in neuroscience. Um, but there are certainly more practical reasons to, to study the brain uh, in terms of society. So this is um, a plot that shows 
what is called the Global Burden of Disease. It was uh, a project from the World Health Organization. So they came, out with a, uh, came up with a metric to try to compare on an equal ground uh, different diseases. And I won't go into the details, but essentially here you can see all, disease, all diseases uh, categorized. Um, and essentially the area here of each of these um, rectangles corresponds to the, the fraction of uh, the global burden of disease for, for this particular disease. So this is for Switzerland. It will look very different for a developing country. So these are infectious diseases, and they are a much bigger fraction of the burden for, for developing countries. But here, in a, in a rich country like Switzerland, you can see some of the biggest contributors. This is heart attacks, stroke, uh, cancer, and so on. And so these are now the neuroscience-related uh, diseases. So here we have psychiatric disorders, uh, uh, neurological disorders, and stroke. Okay. And you can see if you put them together, you get actually something that is larger than cancer itself. And I think you know this uh, comes maybe as a surprise uh, to some people. I think in Switzerland, especially psychiatric disorders, are still kind of a, a taboo. There's some stigma associated with it, uh, but they are really uh, a big part of the burden uh, to society. And so this is a practical reason, right, to study the brain. If we want to cure these diseases, we have to understand something about the brain. And the question then becomes, how should we do this, right? How should we allocate our resources? Should we study uh, these diseases directly? Should we just invest in basic research? Uh, what is the best way of doing this? And, and it's really not a, a new question, right? How one should uh, invest money in research? So this is a statement from 1966, Lyndon Johnson, US president. And so he said, presidents need to show more interest in what the specific results of research are uh, in their lifetime and in their administration. A great deal of basic research has been done, but I think the time has come to zero in on the targets. By trying to get our knowledge fully applied, we must make sure that no life-saving discovery is locked up in the laboratory. And so this is a statement that was made um, in reaction to a project called Project Hindsight, where the Department of Defense had tried to find out um, what was the effectiveness of basic research in developing uh, military weapons. And the conclusion of that study was the contributions of university research were minimal, mission-oriented research proved to be most effective, and then the time lag between discovery and application was shortest when the funding was focused. And I guess one could probably question the, to what extent this uh, is even true for military weapon development, but the problem was that this was then applied much broader uh, than just for military uh, development. So, for example, NIH, the National Institutes of Health, as a reaction uh, to this study, uh, were forced to invest much more in, in uh, mission-oriented research, not so much in basic research. And so scientists were not particularly happy with this, and they tried to, con to convince Congress uh, in particular uh, that this was a bad idea. And one thing that came out of this discussion is this study by Comron and Driggs, which is kind of a seminal study. It's unique uh, in many ways. Um, and so I would like to spend some time discussing it because I think it gives a lot of insight into um, how science actually works um, and, and discovery. And so they try to do something uh, very ambitious. They try to prove scientifically that uh, one should support basic biomedical science. And so they were uh, phys physician scientists. And so the study that they did uh, works as follows. In, in, in the first step, they tried to identify uh, the main clinical advances in the last 10 years uh, in their field of research. And so that was cardiovascular and pulmonary medicine. And so they, they first um, worked with a number of reviewers, consultants, to identify uh, these major clinical advances, and you can see some of them. So this, remember, was published in 1976. And so the last, in the 10 years preceding that, there would have been cardiac surgery, vascular surgery, drug treatment for hypertension, and so on. Right, so you can see uh, these, these, uh, these kind of advances. So then they went on in a second step, and for each of these advances, they tried to identify what are the essential bodies of knowledge that were necessary uh, to achieve these advances. So for example, for cardiac surgery, you need good 
preoperative diagnostics, which means electrocardiography, endocardiography. You have preoperative care and preparation, for example, knowing the blood group of your patient, being able to preserve blood, and so on and so on. And this again, these essential bodies of knowledge were identified with, say, uh, about 140, 150 reviewers that had to uh, uh, come up with uh, this ranking. And then the last step is they took each of these essential bodies of knowledge and they tried to find all the key articles or all the key discoveries that led to these advances. And so here's an example for electrocardiography. And this is actually just a short a selection of the, of the articles that they found. And you can see this goes back to 80 years earlier, uh, the first animal electrocardiography uh, recording. And you know, all the different steps then that led uh, to this being applied in humans. So they looked at total at 4,000 papers. This is at a time when there was no internet, so this was a huge uh, work. It took about 10 years actually to complete this study. And they ended up identifying 529 key articles that contributed to these 10 um, clinical advances. Okay, so now they have these articles and, and out comes the key. They define for each article whether it's clinically oriented or not, meaning uh, did the researcher, when, uh, or researchers, when they contacted this research, did they think about a clinical application? And was it basic research or not? And basic research, they define uh, whether it was concerned with a specific mechanism, just understanding a mechanism of something, or uh, an application. And so what they found is 41% were not clinically oriented, and 62% <coughs> basic research. And so, great. So we've proven that basic research is important. Now, the problem is that, so it turns out that this um, also, the study was criticized in a number of ways. Um, and so, but on two fronts. Okay, the first one is, is this really a scientific study? Because what is a key article? Right? There is no algorithm for defining a key article. What you have to do, you have to go to an expert that knows the field, that knows the history of the field, and he has to decide, or she has to decide, uh, is this a key article or not. What is clinically oriented research? You could have chosen a different um, um, definition than what they did, and how can you do that for, for an article maybe that was published 50 years earlier, when you cannot talk to the researchers anymore? And what is basic research? So, these questions make the whole rating here very subjective, right? There is no, and in that sense, not repeatable uh, in a scientific way. And the other problem is, what do we actually do with these numbers? So what does this mean then for a science policy? What does it mean if 62% of these articles were basic research, what does that mean? How much basic research should we fund compared to clinical research or applied research? It, there is no clear answer, right? So even if this had been 1%, but this 1% was incredibly important, was the one key discovery that, that allowed everything, uh, it doesn't mean that we should have funded basic research only 1%. So actually, they recognize these indications themselves. And in the, in the conclusions of their papers, they, um, they end up focusing on something different, which is essentially that one has to explain what science is about. And so they say public support of science depends in part on public understanding that a major advance is actually the achievement of innumerable scientists. Uh, this will require some change in science education, in science writing, and in the science's presentation of its own work to other scientists uh, and the public. And so it's in this spirit that I see this, uh, this presentation that is really about explaining how I see neuroscience, or the, part, the kind of neuroscience that I do, uh, and how it has led to um, um, clinical advances. Okay, so what is the problem that we're trying to solve uh, in neuroscience? So it's a, a complicated uh, problem. So the brain is probably the most complex structure that, that we know. And it, it is made up of components at very different um, uh, levels of description. Right? So we can start from the genes, genes that encode receptors or other proteins. These make up the neurons that process information. 
and each neuron is connected to thousands of other neurons in local networks. These make up global networks that span the entire brain, and eventually, uh, you know, all of these components lead to behavior. And so, how do we understand if we study, if we want to understand a psychiatric disorder, right? How do we zoom in? What is the level that we need to understand? So one approach has been to just completely bypass all the stuff on the right and try to ask, okay, can we identify a gene that leads to some symptom in some disorder? Okay. And this is successful in some cases if there is such a gene or a few ones, but if you look at a disorder like schizophrenia, there are hundreds of genes involved, uh, all have very small uh, effect. So this is not really helping much uh, in understanding what the disease is and how one should uh, treat it. And so that means one has to go in and actually try to understand the processing of the information uh, at these different levels and try to understand how that uh, relates uh, to some uh, symptom that you observe. So what are then the methods that we have to look at the brain at these levels? So this is a, a kind of a complex slide, but um, so what you see here are essentially all the methods that are available today uh, to study uh, the brain. And on the x-axis, this is the temporal scale that you can, at which they are sensitive. So you can see here processes that evolve uh, at the time scale of one second, 10 seconds, 100 seconds, and down to say one millisecond. And here is a spatial scale, okay, from one millimeter, 10 millimeters, 100 millimeters, and so on. So we need to understand, as I said, all of these spatial scales. We also need to understand all of these temporal scales, right? There are some processes in the brain that occur within a millisecond, others that occur within seconds, hours, and they all matter. And there, so there are two things I want to point out, point out here. So each square is one technique. And you can see that we don't have one technique that gives us access to all of these levels of description. Okay? It's always a patchwork. Uh, some techniques that, for example, work in humans uh, not, that are non-invasive don't give us access uh, to the higher, um, to the, the shorter time scales or the smaller spatial scales. What is good, though, is that we are getting more and more techniques. Right. So this was the situation in 1988. So um, over the course of several decades. Uh, things uh, have improved. We have more techniques uh, than we used to have. And so, very obviously, basic science, not in neuroscience, but in disciplines like physics uh, or uh, even molecular biology, has contributed to all of these techniques. Right? So these, uh, if you look at magnetic resonance imaging, uh, MEG, microscopy, they're all based on often uh, discoveries in physics, very basic phenomena, uh, quantum effects, superconductivity, that obviously were studied without ever thinking uh, they would affect neuroscience uh, later. Right? So clearly, basic science is very important for neuroscience in that it gives us the techniques that we need. And I just want to show you, or maybe if you can lower the light a little bit. One. Um, so what is possible today so this is kind of the best kind of imaging that can be performed today so this is the brain of a larval zebrafish so you can see the scale here this is a very small animal um, and the, you know the body continues here uh, but this is just the brain and so the advantage of this larval uh, zebrafish is that its skin is completely transparent so with a microscope, you can look at the entire brain. And one can actually scan the brain in, in the depth dimension also. And so each of these red blobs here is a neuron. And the neurons encode genetically a marker of activity so that when they're active, they shine some light. And so can, you can now pick this up um, with a microscope. And so one can now record essentially all of the 100,000 neurons uh, in this animal's brain. And this was unimaginable uh, a few decades ago. Right? So this is really what, as a neuroscientist, an experimentalist, one would like to have. And so it's possible now that it is in some simple animals, but more and more uh, it's possible also um, in, in mammals, for example. 
Okay, so this is what I wanted to say about techniques. And now I want to, in the spirit of what Comer and Drix did, I want to take a few clinical advances and show you what research actually led to these clinical advances. And I'll focus on, on a very focused set of, of uh, uh, discoveries that are in systems neuroscience. So this is the level of neuroscience that involves neurons, groups of neurons, and this is the field that I work in. There are obviously a lot of different advances that involve genetics and so on that um, I'm not an expert in, and so in the spirit of common grips, I focus on the stuff that I understand. And so the first example is deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's. So many of you probably know Parkinson's disease, or it's a degenerative disease uh, where um, neurons in a few small nuclei uh, in the brain uh, die off. And that uh, causes mostly motor symptoms, so rigidity, uh, but also uh, tremors or uh, difficulty walking. And I'll show you a movie. And um, there are uh, drugs that are used at first. Um, but then later in advanced uh, Parkinson, one therapy that has emerged is deep brain stimulation. And that involves inject inserting an electrode, so essentially a metal wire, deep into the brain, into a target structure, and then injecting small amount of currents, uh, which essentially block in the end, or normalize abnormal patterns of activity in these regions that are due to the loss of these neurons, of these dopaminergic neurons, how they're called, uh, in, uh, in these parts of the brain. Um, and so this is not a cure for Parkinson's, right? It's, also, it's only um, a way to reduce the symptoms in advanced Parkinson's, uh, but a person can gain many years of uh, high quality life back with this uh, technique. So let me show you how this actually looks like. So this is first a patient uh, that is going to undergo deep brain stimulation uh, before this stimulation. Even a simple task like eating breakfast was a frustrating battle with her own body. How can you love your wife when you're shaking so much? It's extremely difficult, sometimes even overwhelming. And I get very emotional, sometimes I cry. It's, it's just a hard thing to do. The disease had gotten so bad that sometimes her muscles froze completely, making her face almost expressionless, and her legs almost useless. The woman who once was always on the go could barely move, confined to a wheelchair. So the, I'll show you later, there were two um, hospitals in the US where this deep brain stimulation therapy evolved, and she was, I think, the seventh patient in one of, of these hospitals. So this is now right after the uh, first surgery where they implanted a, an electrode in just one hemisphere uh, of her brain, and you see that she has improvements on only one side of her body. Okay, so this was the first implantation and then the second implantation. And, and, and Okay, so you can see this is a highly effective therapy, at least in some people. And so, how did this come about? Right? So the the approval for from the Federal uh, Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. for the most common target of uh, deep brain stimulation, which is the subthalamic nucleus, uh, was given in 2002, and then the first um, um, bigger study. In, in Parkinson's patients was in 1995. Um, and there was an earlier study where um, the electrodes were implanted not in this nucleus, in the S10, but instead in the thalamus, where one only can relieve the tremor, but not the other symptoms, which are actually much more um, important, like the slowness of movement, you know, the rigidity, and so on. So 
how this, this, did this emerge from, from the past therapies in Parkinson? So in the 40s and 60s, um, the only treatment that was available were surgical lesions. Um, and so this was a process more or less performed in trial and error fashion. And sometimes it worked great, like DBS, but sometimes it was catastrophic. So the, the patient essentially could not move at all anymore after the surgery. And so these lesions then were abandoned when a new therapy came about, and that's L-DOPA, which essentially uh, replaces the, the neurotransmitter that is lost when these um, cells die. And so dopamine uh, first had to be discovered. So this is a substance that is secreted by the neurons that die in Parkinson's, and, and it was discovered and recognized as an important neurotransmitter in 1957. Um, and this was got a, a Carson Nobel Prize. And then shortly after dopamine was uh, discovered, it was shown that uh, there was reduced dopamine in Parkinson's patient, and so then uh, the L-DOPA was uh, developed. So this led to a completely abandoning these surgery, surgical treatments, but L-DOPA also has problems. It works in the beginning when it has to increase the dose, and it causes uh, side effects on its own. So people were looking for alternatives. And the alternatives were found um, based on then basic research in, in monkeys. So in the 1970s, Belong uh, started mapping the circuits of um, the areas involved in Parkinson's, that's the basal ganglia. And so that led to an understanding of how these areas even work. So nothing was known really about uh, the normal function of these brain areas. And then chance struck. Okay, what happened is that in 1982, um, a number of patients showed up in hospitals in California um, that had essentially developed Parkinson's overnight, over the course of a, over a few weeks. And it was found out that the reason was that uh, they had consumed heroin that was contaminated with this sub substance, MPTP. And this substance kills exactly the same neurons as Parkinson's does, and so they develop Parkinson's symptoms. And so very quickly it was realized that one could use this to uh, create a model of Parkinson's in the markets. Um, so I'm going to show you also how this works. Case. 50 miles to the south at the Watsonville Community Hospital, two other patients have turned up with symptoms that were equally bizarre and equally mysterious. Two brothers had been found by their mother lying frozen in their apartment unable to move or talk. David Sylvie and his brother Bill. Two healthy young men in their twenties had become invalids overnight. A hundred miles to the north, languishing at the Stanford Medical Center was another case. A young girl of 25 called Connie Saints. Stanford's doctors were mystified. After two weeks of tests, they concluded that her problem was all in her mind and sent her home saying that in time she would snap out of it. So it turns out she didn't snap out of it. Uh, but they did um, respond to L-DOPA treatment. Um, oops. So these are these patients that led to the development of the MPPP model. And so this model was instrumental in understanding what was happening in the brain due to the death of, of these dopaminergic neurons. And it led to a theory of what is actually happening, what is the cause of the symptoms, and then an approach to treating these uh, symptoms, which was lesioning this nucleus, the STN, uh, in the monkeys, in, in uh, uh, MPTP monkeys, I misspelled it, it, misspelled it here, uh, and this reverses the Parkinson's symptoms in these monkeys. So this was one line of research. At the same time, uh, uh, ben Abid had, by chance, discovered that one could use the deep brain stimulation to um, essentially uh, inactivate a, neo, a, a, a particular brain area. So he had discovered this by chance by just turning up the frequency of the stimulator um, in an experiment for reasons that uh, I don't know. But he discovered that suddenly in a, in a patient that had the electrode in the thalamus, he could uh, relieve a tremor in a patient. And um, then they tried using this, as I showed you before, uh, in Parkinson's, uh, again in the thalamus. And then based on this research by Dinong in the monkey, uh, 
they decided to target the STM. And the STM really was not a surgical um, target that was uh, uh, easy and would not have been chosen because it was known that if something went wrong, um, it was the, the consequences were catastrophic. So it was really a combination of this discovery of DBS uh, and the identification of STN as the optimal target that led uh, to this therapy. And so this is just to show how many different research paths had to converge. Uh, the basic research uh, in, in the monkey here, also chance played a role. Right? The, the appearance of this MPPP um, um, patients and then the discovery of, of DBS. And DBS has really taken on now, so um, it's being used for other uh, conditions like obsessive compulsive disorder, and it's being uh, researched either in the clinic or uh, in animals for many other uh, psycho uh, psychiatric or neurological disorders. Okay, so this is the first example. The second example is uh, neuromotor prosthesis. Okay, so this is a, an approach to try to help people that cannot move anymore. So this is mainly people with tetraplegia or people with ALS or Lou Gehrig disease. Um, so that essentially is, especially the ALS patients end up being locked in. So they, their thoughts, their minds seem work perfectly fine, but they have no control anymore over their muscles. So they cannot move any of their muscles that they could, could use, that they, that they could move uh, voluntarily. And so the idea is to try to um, give these patients a new way to interact with their environment. And to take advantage of the fact that, in fact, they can still generate plans of movement. So the brain can still plan a movement, um, but that plan does not get transmitted to the muscles anymore. And so the idea is to bypass the muscles and just control some external device directly with the mind. And so the way one can read out the activity uh, in the brain, the round areas, is with these electrode arrays, uh, which are um, inserted into the surface of, of cortex. Here you can see a structural scan with one of these little arrays uh, in a human subject. And then these are read out uh, and, and fed to a computer. And so again, let me show you how this looks like. So this was one of the first clinical studies where this worked in humans. In this paper, two people with tetraplegia, that is two people who were unable to move their arms or their legs in any functionally useful way, were able to control a prosthetic or a robotic arm simply by thinking about the movement of their own paralyzed hand. And they did that using the investigational brain gate neural interface system. So they thought about using their own arm and hand as though they were reaching out themselves with their own limb. So here you can see there is this device that is attached to the connector, and here is where the signals are being read out. And then they are used to control. So she's controlling the arm by herself with her thoughts. And the robotic arm moved much the way their own arm would have moved. One of the long-standing, one of our participants was able to do something uh, that when all of us saw it uh, for the first time, uh, gave us all pause. She reached out with the robotic arm, she thought about the use of her own hand, she picked up that thermos of coffee, brought it close to her, tilted it towards herself, and uh, sipped the coffee from a straw. And that was the first time in nearly 15 years that she had picked up anything and been able to drink from it solely of her own volition. There was a moment of, of true joy, true happiness. I mean, it was beyond the fact that it was an accomplishment I think an important advance in the entire field. Of so I think it's pretty clear that this would be a big advance uh, for these patients. So this uh, patient was part of a study that was published in 2012, um, where the, for the first time they um, used this approach to control a robotic arm that was preceded by an earlier study where they did only part of that in 2006. And this was really conducted in parallel with similar studies in monkeys. So uh, in 2000, it was the first uh, study where um, the robotic arm was controlled uh, through the signals in the brain of the monkey. And this was then developed after the technology that was eventually used in humans. 
And I want to show you one example of where this is going now. This is one of the most recent studies in Monkey um, of a different approach where instead of controlling the robotic arm, um, um, the monkey controls the cursor on the screen. So instead of using a mouse, for example, which these patients cannot do to, to navigate uh, a screen, um, they control the cursor with their mind. Okay? So this is what, oops. So this is what a monkey sees uh, on a screen in front of him, and he's implanted with the same device that he's been using humans. And so he, his task is to move this cursor to the green dot, okay? And he's doing this completely just with his mind, okay? And you can see it's very effective, right? It's very quick. Uh, not as quick as we could do with a mouse, but still. It certainly uh, is much more than... Uh, what would be otherwise possible. And this, this can be done for many, many months. Okay, so the same array has been implanted. You can see here this is after 10 months, still works great. After 20 months, still works great. So this technology really was developed uh, in the monkeys and is now being applied in the humans. And this is now where also the research in humans is moving more than um, the control of the robotic arm. So this may be a bit simpler. So what was necessary for this to happen? First of all, the technological development was necessary. So these are ways uh, that are needed to record the activity were developed in the 90s. They were originally developed for a different purpose. So the idea was to use them to stimulate cortex, uh, to use them as, as prosthesis, as devices to uh, bypass the eye. So people that are blind to stimulate uh, cortex directly. But now they're, uh, so and this kind of line of research continues, but now they're also being used in this uh, uh, different approach. And then, of course, what was necessary is just identifying where one should put these arrays, right, and how to read out the signals. And this really was all based on basic research. So this research happened way before even the technology existed to think about doing an experiment like this or, you know, a, a, an application like this. So starting in the 60s, the first recordings from senior journeys in my case, in 66, recording from motor cortex, and then the first studies that tried to understand what was, was actually being encoded by these brain areas, the signals that were being processed, and then uh, the first experiments, uh, or the first theories about how uh, activity in these areas leads to movement, and this really was the basis uh, for everything that came up. So again, different factors, right, that contributed eventually to this clinical advance, both from basic research, from technology, from clinical research, uh, uh, animal research, human research, and so on. Now, there's another um, line of work that contributed to this, and that is cochlear implants. Okay, so cochlear implants are a way to essentially um, make people that are deaf hear again if the problem is in the, in the sensory organ, the cochlea. So there are, in many cases, people are deaf um, because the cochlea, the, the sensory organ, doesn't work anymore, uh, but the connection between the cochlea and the brain is still intact. And so it was discovered um, what this code is, how this information is processed, and this can be now be uh, used um, to essentially inject signals artificially into the cochlea. Here we so go. it's coming back on, and he's back on again. See how it turned? Hi, Jonathan. So essentially, this this uh, Hi. guy. Hi. 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 Hi, sweetie. So this boy was born still, um, you know, could hear, but then because of a meningitis at, at, at four months, um, was um, became deaf, and so about six months later, he's now implanted with a, a cochlear implant on one side on the right side. That's why he orients towards the right because that's the only sound he hears, okay? And you can see that, obviously, it works. Um, and nowadays, often, more and more, these implants are implanted in both ears because that improves um, the, the, the perception of sound. And as I said, the idea is that you have a microphone close to the ear, you send this to some processor that then sends these electric signals to the cochlea, and then from there, these go to the brain. So you just bypass the sensory organ. And this research also had its own 
discoveries that uh, underlie it, and mainly just the understanding of how the sensory organ works and how the signals are organized from the sensory organ, from the cochlea, uh, to the brain. And um, this led then to the first cochlear implant in 78 and so on. And I'm mentioning this because these, as I said, these uh, arrays that are now being used, they were originally developed with the idea of doing the same thing as the cochlear implant for something like a retinal uh, implant. So the idea to replace uh, the sensory organs for vision by stimulating the brain. Um, but then again, they were used in a different way. Okay, so the last example uh, is not a clinical example. It's just um, a discovery that really has transformed neuroscience. And another good example of how um, unpredictable the path of discovery is. And so this is optogenetics, and it's a technique that is similar to, to what I showed you with deep brain stimulation, the idea of activating neurons um, by injecting electricity. Here, uh, one can activate or actually also suppress neurons with light, just a shining light on them. And the great advantage is that while with deep brain stimulation, one activates all the neurons in the neighborhood of, of the electrode tip, here uh, one can um, choose specific neural populations and make only them sensitive uh, to the light. And so the main ingredient that was necessary for optogenetics are specific proteins that, that, leave, that one can now uh, um, insert essentially into these neurons. And these proteins are sensitive to light. So when, when you shine light onto them, they cause a current to flow an electric current to flow, which then activates or deactivates the neuron. And so these proteins, they were discovered um, a long time ago in unicellular organisms, like, for example, halobacteria. So halobacteria are bacteria that live in, in very salty environments, so salt ponds, that have very high concentrations of salt. And because of this extreme environment, they developed an evolution. Uh, they evolved uh, such to create these channels that, that regulate uh, the metabolism of the cell. And another kind of light activated channel uh, was found in algae and is part of their mechanism to try to orient uh, towards the light. And so now these exact same channels uh, are now being used, are being expressed with uh, genetic tools uh, in specific uh, groups of neurons. So here is a, a history of optogenetics uh, so the first paper in optogenetics was in 2005, and you can see that it really has exploded. It, has, it is really changing uh, the way neuroscience is being done. But so where did optogenetics come from? The discovery, the first discovery of one of these light activated proteins was in 1971, and it led to you know, a, a constant production of papers in this field where people were trying to find out how these proteins actually work. Um, but 30 years had to pass before this would be applied um, in, in neuroscience. And of course, there was no rationale for studying algae or halobacteria uh, that had to do with any clinical application. But luckily, somebody did study them. And of course, other things had to come again, had to happen before this could be applied. Um, for example, advances in molecular biology and genetic engineering, and also the, the technology, lasers, optical fibers that are necessary to deliver the light uh, into the right place. And so, this has not reached the, the clinic yet, but let me just show you a, a very few examples of how this has, uh, can be used. So, what you're seeing here is the schematics of a box, this square, and the red line is, is essentially the tracks a mouse that was moving in this box. Um, and this is called an open, open field test. So it's a test to uh, essentially uh, see, uh, measure anxiety uh, in a mouse. And so this mouse is anxious and it only hugs the walls. It doesn't want to go in the exposed region in the center. But now you can express this light activated channel in a very small population of neurons in a very small region of the brain you shine light on them, and you activate them, and now suddenly uh, the mouse is not anxious anymore and starts exploring the center. And you can also do the opposite. You can inactivate uh, these neurons in a mouse that was not anxious, and now it becomes anxious. And obviously this has uh, you know, a direct clinical application, but because anxiety is part of many, uh, important component of many psychiatric disorders, 
this is really leading up to a mechanistic understanding of how um, anxiety is coming about and how one might uh, address it. Here's another example. Um, this is a mouse model of seizures. So seizures are is abnormal activity uh, uh, where neurons become very synchronized, um, much more than they should be. And one can measure this, these seizures by recording the potential on the skull. So this is normal. This is EEG, is a normal potential. Then the seizure starts. So you see these big peaks when all these neurons are active together. And then you can act or sorry, inactivate a particular population of neurons in, in a small part of the brain, the thalamus, and you can uh, interrupt the seizure. And you don't turn off the entire brain, you just stop the seizure. And this is now being done uh, in the animal model in a closed loop fashion. So you detect the seizure within a fraction of a second and you stop. So obviously, again, uh, very clear applications are possible. And I'll skip this. Okay, so then, just to finish, I. One last example, okay, and this goes back to what I was saying in the beginning, that really neuroscience is about understanding ourselves. And this is an example of a study that actually looked at uh, the difference between violent offenders, so people in prisons because they've committed uh, an offense, and whether they are psychopath or not. And so psychopathy is a, is a personality disorder, right, that involves uh, um, dysfunctional empathy uh, dysfunctional inhibitory control, and it turns out that um, psychopaths are um, responsible for a large fraction, a much larger fraction of violent crime uh, than non-psychopaths. And sure enough, you can find that activation in the brain uh, in these um, uh, criminals uh, that are psychopathic is different than in non-psychopaths. And so. This kind of study already is having practical consequences in, in uh, legal cases um, because obviously it, it can be used as an argument of whether a, a, a criminal had free will or not, whether he did something just because he couldn't do differently, his brain just uh, was wired up differently than a normal person. Um, so this has clearly practical implications that are being discussed. It's unclear how this should uh, uh, get into law, but it also, again, affects um, much larger questions about what it means to have free will and what it means uh, to be human, and, and there are many studies of this kind that will change uh, our perception of our sense of seeing that. Okay, and so then I'm at the end, and so to finish with a, with a nice, uh, cute picture, this is... Um, a representation of how different disciplines in science are connected to each other. So you can see here language, brain studies, anthropology, you know, all sorts of different disciplines. Each point is one particular journal in that discipline, and the lines try to quantify uh, citation patterns between them. So uh, essentially it means that some discovery in this field is related to some discovery in that field, in that, and so on. And so what I try to convey to you is that, so you can start from some particular discovery in some field, right? and afterwards you can go back and trace all the uh, discoveries and, uh, that, had, that were necessary uh, eventually to, for uh, this particular um, breakthrough, maybe, in a clinical application. And you know, you can, this can have many different arms, right? And again, we can, re we can all plot this as lying along a nice arrow and it makes perfect sense how one um, discovery followed the next. But if you are at the beginning of one of these chains, uh, you just cannot say uh, where this is going to lead. Right? And I showed you a few examples where of discoveries that happened 30 years before they found an application, right? where it was not possible to predict uh, what the consequences would be. Um, and so again, I don't know. Uh, what that means for, for science policy, and maybe Rich will have another uh, series of talks on that, uh, but it certainly shows that um, basic research is a fundamental component uh, of, the, of the scientific process. So, thank you for the time.
before I let you all go to enjoy the after outside, I'd also like to... Um, um, this is Travis, please also join us here. Uh, I'd like to thank you to, again for taking your time uh, tonight talking about the history of chemistry, how basic research in chemistry influenced applications and industries, and also about what we can learn about ourselves and not how basic research helps us in understanding ourselves in neuroscience. And uh, so we don't leave empty-handed, uh, we'd like to give you a small present. Um, I don't know whether it was a waste of money, you have to decide. It's something from Italy, a good bottle of wine and Swiss chocolates. Thank you very much. the approach side, please take the possibility to ask them your questions. If you want to see us reach again, our next event is on the 3rd of December about CRISPR. It's also a discovery from basic research which is uh, starting to change the face of genetics because it allows very precise changes in the genetic code. We will welcome one of the co-discoverers of CRISPR on the 3rd of December who will talk together with a bioethicist about the applications and the perils of it. And on 15th of December we'll tackle the topic of uh, nuclear energy and how it has developed since its beginning in the 50s uh, until now. And now, thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the April.